This is Swami Vishnu Devanandas of the Shivananda Yoga Organization, and he has convened 1975 Paradise Island, Nassau, Bahamas, at the Yoga Retreat, the World Congress of Leaders. Haryam Tatsat. The very purpose of yoga is to keep the mind at ease always. The peace of the mind is not always maintained because of its various emotions and desires based on the I-ness and mindness. It is a selfish feeling of the individual that creates all the problems and as long as they project their own image, and they want to possess things, they want to call everything as mine, 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 they are trapped in the very same things that they possess. And that distributes, disturbs the peace a lot. So if the mind is free from all those attachments, then it's more peaceful, it rests in that peace always. So it is that attachment. It is that selfishness that brings anxiety and until it gets something it wants, even if after it gets, there is the anxiety of holding it on, not losing, the fear of losing comes in. So it creates a lot of problems to the mind. And in a way, even all things that you call mine, mine, are in a way you can translate them as the mine that's planted around the war field. Because whatever you call mine, mine, is going to bother you much. Look around you, how many things you can call mine, mine, mine? Don't you think each mine is ready to explode on you? So the simplest thing is just simply fuse of them. Take the fuse of them. How? Simply label them as thine. Once you call it thine, it's no more yours. You are just using them for the benefit of the humanity. Once the use is over, you just leave it for somebody else and go away. And the mind rests at peace. So the very basis of all the disturbances, of all the individual restlessness, communal or even national, is the individual ego. The ego can be expanded as national ego, racial ego, even religious ego. My religion, your religion. So all these my, 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 my is the one that causes all the problems. That's why the keynote of any religion is to dedicate yourself, sacrifice this selfishness, be relieved of this I-ness and minus, the ahankar and mamakar. Then the mind rests in peace always. Well, it all started about a decade ago, 10 years ago, when probably at my uh, lowest point in my life, when I needed spiritual help at the very most, some miracle brought me to, um, to Paris to help Conrad Rooks with his film, when at that time, Swamiji, Swami Sachinanda was a guest of Conrad Rooks, who was also at that time helping him out with his life in yoga. And I remember the day, one, one morning for breakfast, when I just got there, when Conrad Rooks said to me, he says, Peter, you know how to meet my Swami, I think he can solve your problems. And uh, I remember we were sitting there for breakfast, he had called the Swamiji, and he had come out, and uh, the elevator doors opened up, and there was Swami Satchananda, gloriously walking towards me in orange robe. It's the first time I'd ever seen a sight like that. And um, he, uh, as he walked towards me, all the pain and all the anguish I'd felt disappeared. As I got involved in the yoga, uh, I learned really how to draw and paint. I knew that to draw is to be an open channel. And what I would do is I would put my pen on the paper and I would let, just let the drawing occur. It's as though if somebody was watching over my shoulder and seeing the drawing occur, myself and the individual were equally surprised as to see how the drawing developed. I learned about the characters, the sages and saints, and all the beautiful drawings that came out, actually from the drawings themselves. It was really fabulous because 
Now I had all of this behind me. I designed products that went all over the world. I painted Swami Vishnu's plane. a very beautiful phrase which we're all familiar with, unity and diversity. This means that underlying all of the infinite variety of manifest life that exists in the universe, there's a common denominator to it all. This common denominator is the field of unity. This field of unity is transcendental. Meditation is the technique that we know that leads the attention of the mind to this transcendental field of life within. And having touched that and experienced that, which is the source of all life, then we can understand by our own experience what this field of unity means. It's a direct experience. It's being able to tap the source of all life, unmanifest life. And having touched that, we can appreciate what it means, the phrase, unity in diversity. Therefore, we can appreciate and understand and value all forms of life due to our direct experience of this transcendental field of unity. So this is unity consciousness. We all hope for a better world, which means better communication. In order to communicate with other species of life, with our own species as human beings, and with intercommunication with other animals. If we can communicate from this deep level of transcendental consciousness or unity consciousness, then we know automatically that we're sharing the same field. Therefore, communication becomes clearer and more easy. A few years ago, I had an interesting experience of being asked to play for some killer whales which live uh, in Victoria, B.C., my home. And they were testing uh, this intercommunication between species to see if it was possible to communicate with whales. It had been found that uh, dolphins, of which the whales are a species of dolphin, these killer whales, uh, are very intelligent mammals. And therefore, we're trying to find out more about them, how to communicate with them. Uh, as part of uh, some experiments that were done up in that area, uh, to measure this intelligence, I was asked to come down and play some music to see how uh, the male and female killer whales would respond, if there would be any response at all. And what was very beautiful was that right from the beginning, there was communication. Uh, they are very spiritual animals. And because I could feel deep within myself the music coming through me from having tapped this source of of all creativity within this field of unity, then I was not playing my flute on an intellectual basis uh, to this whale, but simply letting the music flow through me and out to him to see what his response would be. And it was very positive. There would be a lot of answering back from me, uh, from him rather, sounds that he would make in response to my flute. And uh, I would like to give you a little example of, of some some of the playing that I would do for Hyde of the Killer Whale.
if there is any success in this conference and uh, we are able to bring these various leaders together is because of master's grace. He is behind, I know that otherwise I could not have done anything and there will be, uh, see in fact one of the neighbor came and told, how are you able to keep these people such in a peaceful condition, 600 people in a small area without one incident. Then I said it because of the yogic discipline taught by your master, that's a, so that's, that shows that master's grace is there. And my encounter with master is in, when I was very in my teens, 17, when I was in the army, I came to know him through a literature and I saw him first time, I knew he is not just an ordinary human being or ordinary gurus. He is not even a guru, he never considered himself a guru, but he is completely a childlike, a person like childlike nature, but full of wisdom, full of strength. And when he smiles, his whole body will smile. Always continuously, there is an emanation of energy from his body and his eyes. His eyes are like a sparkling gold. So he summed up the whole of his teaching in this song. Serve, love, give, purify, meditate, realize. Be good, do good, be kind, be compassionate. Serve, love, give, purify, meditate, realize. Be good, do good, be kind, be compassionate. Adapt, adjust, accommodate, bear insult, bear injury, highest sadhana. Adapt, adjust, accommodate, bear insult, bear injury, highest sadhana. This is his main teachings and we are following his teachings and we are trying to bring unity in diversity using the yogic discipline and yogic life. It's been a wonderful learning experience for me as perhaps one of the organizers of the, the Congress. And, and I thank uh, my Master Swamiji and Swami Shivananda for giving me the opportunity to serve the Shivananda mission through this Yoga Congress. And I'm sure that it won't be the last of Swamiji's 
quote unquote good ideas. Some of these ideas are usually uh, involve a lot of hard work and perhaps a lot of um, a lot of frustration, but the rewards and benefits for the individual and for humanity are always so so powerful and so abundant that somehow we pray that Master gives us the strength to go on. How did you meet Swamiji and get involved in yoga? Uh, I really didn't uh, meet Swamiji, so to speak. Got, got involved in yoga when I was going to college. I guess pretty typical, involved in the peace movement, kind of thinking about getting involved in drugs, but thank God I didn't. And just wanting to help humanity, wanting to help society, wondering what to do. And, you know, being in the middle of that crowd that just about going haywire and wondering, well, is this the, is this the only way that, it, you know, that we can help society? Is this the only social action we can take? If people don't have any control over their minds and emotions, how can they deal with their enemies? Uh, it, came, it came very clear to me that you have to love the people that you're up against as much as you love yourself and your own ideas. And it just happened that a yogi came to my college at the time and he talked about self-mastery and self-control and put two and two together and decided I really must go and learn yoga. So actually just hearing that there was a yoga camp somewhere in Canada uh, in the fall, I got into my car and just drove in the general direction. I guess I was guided. My first experience with Swamiji was seeing a little orange man sitting in a school bus with a turban wrapped around his head, not really knowing what a Swami even was, not really even looking for a guru, and having no concept of, of wanting to take to Hatha Yoga and Raja Yoga. I fell into the Shivananda Yoga Vedanta organization. With the new age, the coming of the new age, there are many wonderful teachers who come with their wonderful teachings. And the most that a teacher can help you with is to turn, help turn you on to the teacher within yourself, your true self, your inner voice. And I have a little song about that, which I call the guru in you. Well, I got a little friend in the back of my mind. I can speak to him most any old time, he says. Well, I met him one day while I was under a tree, and I heard this voice speaking to me. He said, how do you do? I'm the guru in you. Well, now, sometimes I'm scared and quite unprepared for the things that I find in my mind. But if I persevere, all the things in my mind become clear, usually. So I said, can it be there's a guru in me? And how can I know for sure? And then he said, just ask, and we'll tackle any task. So I said, OK, I'll go along. The song, say, how do you do, Mr. Guru? Well, now, sometimes I'm scared and quite unprepared for the things that I find in my mind. But now me and the guru are getting along just fine. And he says, just relax and play your acts and the world will come to you. And have no fear, for I am here to help and guide you through. For I am the light of the love in your heart, so remember whatever you do. Consult the guru in you. You've got to consult the guru in you. Now don't forget, whatever you do, consult, never insult the guru in you. Shangar Hapro de Pendeve, Sada Pujida, Samam Pad Sarasadi, Bhagavadi, Nishet Jadia Baham, O Namashiva, I grew away, Sachidan and the Murte, 
Now, right leg gently over the head. Up. Uh, change. Left leg. Up. Uh, now, both the legs over the head, the plow position. Hands back, grab your toes. Yoga is a combination of physical, mental, and spiritual process. When it mind, body, mind, and the soul are brought together, it's called yoga. Uh, in the earlier stage, a student has been taught the physical discipline called asanas before he can go to the mental discipline, which is very hard for a yeah, beginner. Position, Downhill is easy, face this way, you can get up easy. Downhill, face this way. Okay, position, inhale, slow motion up. Um. Now, right leg forward, left leg back, one, two, one. Two, one, two. So, asana, exercise, and pranayama, breathing, and uh, diet, vegetarian, of course. He is able to enter into the second step called meditation, or control of, controlling of the mind. And when the meditation becomes perfect, it reaches, it brings him to super conscious state called uh, union between the individual and the supreme. And uh, so yoga means union between the individual and the supreme. And there are several definitions are there. Main definition is union between the individual and the supreme. Other definition is yoga stavrti nirodha. Raja Yoga says yoga stavrti nirodha. Yoga is controlling and subjugation of the mental modifications. Modifications are something like the waves, the, the ocean and the waves. The ocean is, the, is made up of water, but waves also made up of water. And there is no difference between ocean and the wave, but the waves are the modification of the of the ocean. Same way, the mind is the ocean and there is modification or waves called thought waves. These thought waves disturbs our peace of mind in continuous thought, various types of negative thought, positive thought, neutral thought, and they are continuously pouring into the mind. First, students are taught how to remove the negative thoughts and neutral thoughts and put with the sublime thought and eventually he controls all thoughts and go beyond the thought and there will, then the mind will become like a lake or an ocean without waves and he finds tranquility. But the trouble has been created by man. We have to seek for causes for whatever there exists which is not contributing to happiness, harmony, welfare, true progress and well-being. We have to seek for these factors in the nature of man, in the manner in which man utilizes whatever God has given to him, both internal within himself, subjective, and external without himself in this objective universe. You can waste a thing, you can put a thing to noble, good use. The Congress, as I see it, has been convened to provide an occasion for people engaged in teaching yoga in different parts of the United States and Canada particularly and different parts of the world in general. That is why it's an international congress. To give them an occasion to get together, compare notes, exchange ideas and 
thus enrich themselves with the added knowledge so that they may do this work more effectively and in a better way. They will find this therefore a very valuable period to listen to people's ideas and to go back with added wisdom, with reinforced confidence and with a newer vision so that their teaching of yoga would now be filled with a new quality of idealism, new quality of uh, spirituality and also a new factor that yoga has a place in the total evolution of mankind in this world and so quite apart from its benefit to the individual who comes and learns yoga from you and to whom you teach yoga, it also has got a much wider significance in the context of world affairs. prepared to fight nuclear wars, which uh, we hope will never come. In fact, we're overprepared for that. If we assume that everyone says that the Russians are our principal enemies. The conservative estimates are that we have enough nuclear weapons to destroy all Russian population centers and centers of power 15 times, and that they have enough to destroy us five times. And the second point of emphasis uh, in yoga that I think is important is, is that of self-discipline, and that as a nation, uh, we have become the greatest over-consumers in the world of food and of fuel and of transport. And uh, this uh, reaches a point where, where it has reached a point where it's a national problem. Well, dear friends, I, I don't think I've ever been a, invited to a meeting in which everyone seemed to think he had to explain to the press why he had answered the invitation. <laughs> uh, I... Uh, I was asked why I was here, which was, I couldn't really answer that. If they said, why did you come, I could have given an answer. But I was here really because I was invited to come, and I came because I wanted to. I didn't quite know why I was invited, but I, <coughs> but I didn't pursue that too far, and I was rather pleased to, in some of the earlier explanation about the kind of, uh, of sort of non-yoga people who were being invited that supposedly they had prospects of world leadership. And I want you to know you're the first group that's, uh, at least in my, in, in recent months, that has seen that prospect for me. And I'm very, very... I learned very early after arriving here that it was improper to enter the grounds with your shoes on. <laughs> I did not understand fully because the yoga spirit had not permeated every fiber of my body. <laughs> but since having been here now I proudly remove the shoes from my feet because I have the feeling, like Moses of old, that the ground I stand on is holy ground. I think that yoga uh, offers to the Christian community a great challenge and a great opportunity to live out its creed. I firmly believe in our Christian religion. Unfortunately, we do not have many individuals who will practice our faith, our religion. I do not believe that Christianity has been uh, tried and found difficult. 
I think that Christianity has been found difficult and not tried. And I think that yoga bu has built a community of love and brotherhood and oneness that really challenges the Christian community to live that religion that was taught by our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the master of us all. And if we will practice that religion as yoga practices the principles on which it was founded, then God's kingdom will come on earth and his will will be done down here as it is in heaven. Please know that I may not pronounce the words of the Swamis uh, correctly, but I certainly will not be derelict at all in my generosity and thanksgiving that rest in my heart at this hour. To them, and especially that Swami of great love and admiration, whom I call Vishnu, who has made me feel so much at home and to go out of his way and in order to give me a sense of belonging and worth and dignity. Now realize that we have gathered here several hundred people who are on the path to higher knowledge. From all ordinary standards, you would have nothing in common. You are black, Protestants, Europeans, Jewish, South Americans, Eurasians, Catholics, white and Hindu. You are teachers, social workers, technicians, laborers, administrators, secretaries, merchants, and craftsmen. This Congress is convened under the motto, Unity in Diversity. We are complex instruments capable of being more and more finely tuned. The ultimate attunement is achieved when one feels a oneness, a merging, an all-encompassing love for self, humanity, and the universe. So let us assume that the world is a small spaceship. Let us all move together in the spaceship. And if you want to live harmony, and want to find harmony and peace, in this spaceship we must find out peace in our own heart. And this is the aim of the TWO. So once again, I welcome you all, distinguished guests, as well as all the teachers from various groups, I pray to the Almighty that we will be all united again in God. Om Shanti. Om Sahana Vavadu Sahano Bhunaktu Sahaviryam Karavavahai Tejasvinavadhi Damastuma Vidyushavahai Thi Om Shanti Shanti Shanti
much. It's such a great joy for me to share this evening with you and to be a part of your beautiful Congress. The purpose of this Congress is to, first of all, bring all the yoga leaders, spiritual leaders, political leaders, leaders in the fields of arts and crafts together to form a common platform and the common platform is yoga or yogic discipline. That is what the TWO is meant for. TWO means true world order, is to bring unity in diversity. We cannot have one type of religious leader for all the humanity or one type of political leader or any other form of leaders. Yet, if we accept that unity can be found in the diversity, there will be peace in this world. For this TWO uses the technique or science of yoga for self-mastery and self-discipline. The motto of the TWO is the individual must find peace within before we can find the peace outside. The world is just like a cloth I am wearing. This cloth is made up of cotton and each thread is cotton thread. So by using the cotton thread, it became a cotton cloth. If I want to change this cloth into silk, then every thread must be changed then only I will have silk cloth. So, cloth is nothing but the thread. So, the universe is nothing but the individuals like you and me. Until we know what that inner peace is, we will not be able to bring the world peace. India, although it is a secular state, secular not in the sense of being irreligious, but because it shows equal respect to all religions. Because India's culture and history represent a yoga or a synthesis, a harmony of almost all the races, religions and cultures of the world. We have over 65 million Muslims in our country, although we do not call ourselves an Islamic country. We have over 15 million Christians, 12 million Sikhs, 4 million Buddhists, less than a million Zoroastrians, Jains, animists, agnostics, atheists, Hindus, all, all religions practically of the world. But as Mahatma Gandhi once said, he said, uh, religions are many, but religion is one. Well, it was the age of 15, I met a yogi in Kashmir and uh, he taught me how to do the asanas, and I did them till the age of about 50, 55. I never had any serious illness. And I was surprised to find yesterday, after about five years, I did uh, the shish asana. I was surprised I could do it. Yes, Pandit Nehru used to do um, yoga asanas till almost his passing away, and Mrs. Gandhi still does them every day, and she is 57. Well, it's not only North America. I think yoga has a lot to offer to the whole world, and particularly to the industrialized uh, societies of the West, where the tempo of life is so fast, you have no time to stand or stare.
How are you all? Om Namah Shivaya, 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 Om Namah Shivaya. Om Namah Shivaya, 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 Om Namah Shivaya. How's the Congress going? Oh, Congress is beautiful. Our staffs are marvelous. Everyone is working hard, except Swami Vishnu, who is lying in the <laughs> hammock and enjoying his life. <laughs> Swami Nada Brahmananda is a master of the science of Tan, which was developed by the great 16th century musician Tan Sen. Through his knowledge of this science, 
Swami Nada Brahmananda has developed the ability to direct the vibrations of his singing to the various parts of his body. His body is then vitalized and purified by this energy. This accounts for his extraordinary good health at the age of 80. coming constantly after. Mm. Yes, we catch. All the gates of the body and the head, of the eyes are closed. His uh, capacity to <laughs> to overcome this body is uh, just like it wasn't there. His uh, stomach muscles, his chest muscles, his throat. Uh, I could not stop anything from happening. If he wanted it, it happened. When you go into Sahaj Yoga meditation, you sit straight but not tight. You take deep, slow breaths. And you surrender to the energy that is released in the body from the purity of your body and mind and feelings from your earlier work. As one would continue in such a meditation for 45 minutes or an hour for the ordinary aspirants, or four or five hours for a serious sadhak, various mudras, asanas, pranayam take place automatically and spontaneously. Eventually, the body and the mind and the feelings are so purified that you go into the withdrawal of the senses to pratyahar and to spontaneous concentration, meditation, and samadhi. <laughs> 